in the history of science is it's always fascinating to me how there can be scientists working in completely different fields along completely different tracks, not really paying attention to each other, just doing their own thing for their own interests, pursuing their thing, and end up completely revolutionizing another field that they didn't even really care about. Like they're just working in parallel like this, chewing on their problems, following their passions, and oh, there's a little discovery over here, whatever, no big deal. And then percolates over through the years, and then boom, it, like it goes nuts. And I think one of the best examples of this is the introduction of spectroscopy into astronomy. Because spectroscopy is like, the thing that we use to figure out how stuff in the universe, what it's all made of. And it wasn't necessarily developed by astronomers. There was an astronomical component for sure, but the people who were interested in cracking this problem just like weren't necessarily astronomers. Like, like, like take Newton. All right, Newton is studying the properties of light. He's interested in optics. He's interested in colors and propagation. And, and he looks at prisms. And he wasn't the first person to look at prisms. I mean, like, ancient Romans had looked at prisms, so it was no big deal. But for a long time, the default assumption was you put light inside of a prism, the prism does something, and then generates this rainbow. But Newton was the first person to figure out that, no, the prism isn't doing the generation of light, of the colors. The colors are actually in the white light itself. Instead, what the prism is doing is separating those colors into the rainbow. And he was just doing this for his own fun. And as the centuries and decades and so on went on, especially into the 1800s, people were using better and better prisms because they and they were mostly interested in just studying properties of light. I mean, the pro, the what light is is a major question that still kind of boggles us today. And they were using prisms to study what light is. And one of the sources of light to study, it's not like you can turn on flashlights or lasers or anything like that, was the sun itself. And another source of light they had was flames, you know, fires. The, they had these two things that generated light, and they were using it in their experiments. And in the mid-1800s, uh, Josef von Fraunhofer, say that name five times fast, wanted to compare these two sources of light. He wanted to compare light from a flame to light from the sun. So he perfected a spectrum a way of measuring spectra and a spectrum is just the name we give to the rainbow the components of some light he wanted to measure very carefully these spectra it was a spectrometer or a spectrometer where light came in hit a prism the prism did its rainbow thing and then the rainbow was projected onto you know a ruler so he could very very quantitatively measure what's going on how much blue how much red how wide is the blue how wide is the red etc cetera, etc cetera. and he compared using his spectrometer light from the sun to light from a flame and he found that they were different that when he looked very, very carefully at the spectrum of the sun, there were missing gaps. There were little dark bands in the spectrum itself. And he couldn't really explain it. He didn't know what was going on. All he knew that the sun was not on fire. But he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. That, was, that itself was like an interesting like, hmm, sun's not on fire. wonder what's going on. It, took, it would take us like another century to figure it out. Fraunhofer also developed and perfected something we call diffraction grading, which is a way of making spectra way better than a prism. I mean, you think a prism is awesome? It's only because you haven't met a diffraction grading. And diffraction grading is actually a very simple, straightforward device. It's a little screen with, with gaps cut in it, little slits, little, little tiny slits, and not just one or two, but like a thousand or a hundred thousand all packed into a very small area. And what's happening 
when light passes through these slits, you get diffraction. When light passes through a very narrow opening, it spreads out. And if it light passes through two narrow openings, the two beams of light both spread out and they will interfere with each other. Sometimes they'll add together and sometimes they'll cancel each other out. And you can just keep doing this slit after slit after slit so you get all these interference of all these waves of light. And the interference pattern depends on the color. So if you send red light down through some slits, you'll get a certain pattern like this. Let's say you this is where the red light likes to interfere with itself and add together. And then this is where the red light uh, cancels itself out. Then you send blue light and it will do the same thing, but it will be like this. Because of its wavelength, it will have a slightly different pattern. So what you get when you put white light through is the whole rainbow. It's a it's a spectrometer or sorry, a diffraction grating is a way of sorting colors. It says, okay, okay, light comes in, a whole big mystery bag of wavelengths, all the, the colors mixed together in some ways. Okay, uh, all reds go here, all yellows go here, all greens go here, all blues go here, purples go here. Like it spreads it out. And the more you can pack down, the more slits you can add into an area, the wider you can get your spectrum, which means the, the finer resolution you have and the more details you can see in that spectrum. Later scientists were using the, these diffraction gratings to study what happens when you know elements caught on fire. Again, they needed a light source. This is all based on light. You either got the sun or you got flames. And you also have flames with extra stuff tossed in. And we had known for a long time that when you drop different chemicals, different elements in a flame, you get a flash of different colors. But no one had really quantitatively measured this until the chemists of Kirchhoff and Bunsen. Bunsen, you may be familiar because of Bunsen burner. Kirchhoff probably doesn't ring a bell. That's fair. Okay, not everyone can be famous. Sorry, Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff and Bunsen were dropping elements into flames and then looking at the light as it pa after it passed through a diffraction grating so they could very clearly see the spectrum. And they were able to make the connection that individual elements, when they get hot, give off very distinct patterns of light. They give off very distinct spectra. So you can drop, say, sodium in a flame and you'll see the light, there'll be some very specific bright lines on top of the light from the flame. So there's a light from the flame, and then you drop in that sodium, and you'll get like a flash, like, ooh, certain wavelengths will like pop up. And then you drop something else in, and you'll get a completely different set of lines, a completely different pattern. And something else, a completely different, every single element, every single molecule had its own set of distinct spectral lines, the individual elements had their own fingerprint of light that you could distinguish through the spectrum. Which means if you just if you just gave Kirchhoff and Bunsen a random spectrum, like, okay, here's some random light I picked up on my way to the grocery store. Can you tell me what element it is? They'd be sure, like, sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, let me see. That wave like that wave. Oh yeah, that's the pattern. That's the pattern for sodium. That's the pattern for gold. That's the pattern for neon. All the stuff. Like they could figure it out. Once you start attaching a diffraction grating, a spectrometer to the business end of a telescope, then you can use this technique to figure out what stuff and stuff in space is made of. But the key developments for introducing this revolutionizing technology in astronomy didn't really come from astronomers. It came from physicists. It came from people interested in optics. It came from chemists. And then the astronomers who at this point have like, you know, just measuring like very accurately positions of stuff in space and like taking sketches and getting a little bit bored. They're like, wait a minute. You, we can, we can know what stuff in space is made out of. That was the face of every 19th century astronomer. 
Next week, I'll tell you more about how we use spectroscopy to figure out how stuff in space is made of. Thank you so much for watching. Please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. It's how, it's how we keep all this stuff going. Really, all my education and outreach activities funded by Patreon, funded by you. It is your responsibility. No pressure, but it's all you. Also, please like, share, and subscribe. Do all the normal YouTube things. I really appreciate it, and I will see you next week.